Okie doke, fellas. Welcome back to the Sleepless Tales reading of No Longer Human by Osamu Desai. We're on part six of the reading, which is uh, the third notebook and the second half of it. For me, that's starting on page 112. Don't forget to like, comment, favorite, subscribe, and uh, let's get into the reading. All right, let's go. Um, so previously, we had um, the one girl come in from Horiki's house, and she immediately hits up main character fella, and she says, I'm going to give you a ride home. So that's where we are right now. She was born in Koshu and was 28. She lived in an apartment in Koenji with her five-year-old girl. She told me that her husband had died three years before. You look like someone who's had an unhappy childhood. You're so t sensitive. <laughs> More's the pity for you. I led for the first time the life of a kept man. After Shizuko, that was the name of the lady journalist, went out to work in the morning at the magazine publishers, her daughter, Shigeko, and I obediently looked after the apartment. Shigeko had always been left to play in the superintendent's room while her mother was away, and now she seemed delighted that an interesting uh, uncle had turned up as a new playmate. For about a week, I remained in a state of daze. Just outside the apartment window was a kite caught in the telegraph wires, blown about and ripped by the dusty spring wind. It nevertheless clung tenaciously to the wires, as if an affirmation of something. Every time I looked at the kite, I had to smile with embarrassment and blush. It haunted me, even in dreams. I want some money. Uh, how much? she asked. A lot. Love flies out the window when poverty comes in the door, they say. And it's true. <laughs> Don't be silly. Such a trite expression. It is. But you don't understand. I may run away if things go on at this rate. <laughs> which of us is the poor one? And which will run away? What a silly thing to say. I want to buy my drinks and cigarettes with my own money. I'm a lot better artist than Horiki. At such times, the self-portraits I painted in high school, the ones Takeichi called ghost pictures, naturally came to mind. My lost masterpieces. These, my only really worthwhile pictures, had disappeared during one of my frequent changes of addresses. I afterwards painted pictures of every description, but they all fell far, far short of these splendid works as I remembered them. I was plagued by a heavy sense of loss, as if my heart had become empty. The undrunk glass of absinthe. A sense of loss, which was doomed to remain eternally unmitigated stealthily, began to take shape. Whenever I spoke of painting, that undrunk glass of absinthe flickered before my eyes. I was agonized by the frustrating thought, if only I could show them those paintings, they would believe in my artistic talents. Do you really? You're so adorable when you joke that way with a serious face. But it was no joke. It was true. I wish I could have shown her those pictures. I felt an empty chagrin, which suddenly gave way to resignation. I added, cartoons, I mean. I'm sure I'm better than Horiki at cartoons, if nothing else. Those clownish words of deceit were taken more seriously than the truth. <laughs> yes, that's so. I've really been struck by those cartoons you're always drawing for Shigeko. I burst out laughing over them myself. How would you like to draw for our magazine? I can easily ask the editor. Her company published a monthly magazine. Not an especially notable one for children. Most women have only to lay eyes on you to want to be doing something for you so badly they can't stand it. You're always so timid, and yet you're funny. Sometimes you get terribly lonesome and depressed, but that only makes a woman's heart itch for you all the more. 
Shizuko flattered me with these and other compliments, which, with the special personal quality of the kept man, I calmly accepted. Whenever I thought of my situation, I sank all the deeper into my depression and I lost all my energy. It kept praying in my mind that I needed money more than a woman, that any way I wanted to escape from Shizuko and my own living. I made plans of every sort but my struggles only enmeshed me the more in my dependence on her. This strong-minded woman herself dealt with the complications which developed from my running away and took care of almost everything else for me. As a result, I became more timid than ever before. At Shizuko's suggestion, a conference took place attended by Flatfish, Horiki, and myself at which it was concluded that all relations between me and my family were to be broken, and I was to live with Shizuko as man and wife. Thanks also to Shizuko's efforts, my cartoons began to produce a surprising amount of money. I bought liquor and cigarettes, as I had planned, with the proceeds. But my gloom and depression grew only the more intense. I had sunk to the bottom. Sometimes, when I was drawing The Adventures of Kinta and Ota, the monthly comic strip for Shizuko's magazine, I would suddenly think of home. And this made me feel so miserable that my pen would stop moving, and I looked down through brimming tears. At such times, the one slight relief came from little Shigeko. By now, she was calling me a daddy with no sign of hesitation. Daddy, is it true that God will grant you anything if you pray for it? I thought that I, for one, would like to make such a prayer. Oh, vouchsafe unto me a will of ice. Acquaint me with the true natures of human beings. Is it not a sin for a man to push aside his fellow? Vouchsafe unto me a mask of anger. Uh... Yes, I'm, I'm sure he'll grant Shigeko anything he wants, but I don't suppose Daddy has a chance. I was frightened, even by God. I could not believe in his love, only in his punishment. Faith. That, I felt, was the act of facing the tribunal of justice with one's head bowed to receive the scourge of God. I could believe in hell, but it was impossible for me to believe in the existence of heaven. Uh, why haven't you a chance? Because I disobeyed what my father told me. Uh, did you? But everybody says that you're so nice. That's because I deceived them. I was aware that everybody in the apartment house was friendly to me, but it was extremely difficult for me to explain to Shigeko how much I feared them all and how I was cursed by the unhappy peculiarity that the more I feared people, the more I was liked. And the more I was liked, the more I feared them. A process which eventually compelled me to run away from everybody. I casually changed the subject. Shigeko, what would you like from God? <laughs> I would like my real daddy back. I felt dizzy with the shock. An enemy. Was I Shigeko's enemy or was she mine? Here was another frightening grown-up who would intimidate me. A stranger. An incomprehensible stranger. A stranger full of secrets. Shigeko's face suddenly began to look that way. I had been deluding myself with the belief that Shigeko, at least, was safe. But she, too, was like the ox, which suddenly lashes out with its tail to kill the horsefly on its flank. I knew that from then on, I'd have to be timid, even with that little girl. Is the lady killer at home? Oriki had taken to visiting me again at my place. I could not refuse him. Even though this was the man who had made me so miserable the day I ran away, I welcomed him with a feeble smile. Your comic strips are getting quite a reputation, aren't they? There's no competing with amateurs. They're so foolhardy that they don't know when to be afraid. But don't get overconfident. 
Your composition is still not worth a damn. He dared to act the part of the master to me? I felt my casual empty tremor of anguish at the thought. I can imagine the expression on his face if I showed him the ghost pictures, but I protested instead. Don't say such things. You'll make me cry. Horiki looked all the more elated with himself. If all you've got is just enough talent to get along, sooner or later, you'll betray yourself. Just enough talent to get along. I really had to smile at that. Imagine saying that I had enough talent to get along. It occurred to me that a man like myself, who dreads human beings, shuns and deceives them, might on the surface seem strikingly like another man who reveres the clever, worldly rules for success embodied in the proverb, let sleeping dogs lie. Is it not true that no two human beings understand anything whatsoever about each other? That those who consider themselves bosom friends may be utterly mistaken about their fellow, and, failing to realize this sad truth throughout a lifetime, weep when they read in the newspapers about his death? Horiki, I had to admit, participated in the settlement after my running away. Though reluctantly, under pressure from Shizuko, and he was now behaving exactly like the great benefactor to whom I owed my rehabilitation, or like the go-between of romance. The look on his face as he lectured me was grave. Sometimes he would barge in late at night, dead drunk, to sleep at my place, or stop by to borrow five yen, invariably five yen. You must stop your fooling around with women. You've gone far enough. Society won't stand for more. What, I wondered, did he mean by society? The plural of human beings? Where was the substance of this thing called society? I had spent my whole life thinking that society must certainly be something powerful, harsh and severe. But to hear Horiki talk made the words, don't you mean yourself, come to the tip of my tongue. But I held the words back. Reluctant to anger him. Mm, society won't stand for it. It's not society. You're the one who won't stand for it, right? If you do such a thing, society will make you suffer for it. It's not society. It's you, isn't it? Before you know it, you'll be ostracized by society. It's not society. You're going to do the ostracizing, aren't you? Words. Words of every kind went flitting through my head. Know thy particular fearsomeness, thy knavery, cunning, and witchcraft. What I said, however, as I wiped the perspiration from my face with a handkerchief was merely, uh, You've put me into a cold sweat. Uh, I smiled. Mm. From then on, however, I came to hold almost as a philosophical conviction the belief what is society but an individual? From the moment I suspected that society might be an individual, I was able to act more in accordance with my own inclinations. Shizuko found that I had become rather self-willed and not so timid as before. Horiki remarked that it was funny how stingy I had become, or as Shigeko had it, I had stopped being so nice to Shigeko. Without a word, without a trace of a smile, I spent one day after the next looking after Shigeko and drawing comic strips, some of them so idiotic that I couldn't understand them myself for the various firms which commissioned them. Orders had gradually started coming in from other publishers, all of an even lower class than Shizuko's company. Third-rate publishers, I suppose they'd be called. I drew them extremely excessively depressed emotions, deliberately penning each line only to earn money for drink. When Shizuko came home from work, I would dash out as if in relay with her and head for the outdoor booths near the station to drink cheap, strong liquor. Somewhat buoyed after a bout, I would return to the apartment. I would say, the more I look at you, the funnier your face seems. Do you know I get inspiration for my cartoons from looking at your face when you're asleep? 
What about your face when you sleep? You look like an old man, a man of 40. It's all your fault. You've drained me dry. Man's life is like a flowing river. What is there to fret over? On the riverbank, a, a willow tree. Hurry to bed. Stop making such a racket. Would you like something to eat? She was quite calm. She did not take me seriously. If there's any liquor left, I'll drink it. Man's life is like a flowing river. Man's river. No, I mean, the river flows, the flowing of life. I would go on singing as Shizuku took off my clothes. I fell asleep with my forehead pressed against her breast. This was my daily routine. This bit's in French, so here's my best French impression. Et puis, en recommence encore la médian, avec seulement le même réglé que la vieille, et qui est de vêter les grandes joies barbares, de même que les grandes de l'ours, comme un crapaud cantore un pierre sur son chemin. I know Spanish, I'm not good at French, okay? Anyways, um, I'm a, this book was originally written in Japanese. Sometimes they'll put passages in English, so during the English translation, they'll put it into French or something like that. So translated, this means, and then we start again the next day, with only the same rule as the day before, and which is to avoid great barbaric joys, as well as painful hikes, like a toad contours a stone on its way. Which isn't a perfect translation, it's been translated through three languages. Anyways, here's back to the story. When I first read in translation these verses by Guy Charles Cross... I blushed until my face burned. The toad. That is what I was. A toad. It was not a question of whether or not society tolerated me. Whether or not it ostracized me. I was an animal. Lower than a dog. Lower than a cat. A toad. I sluggishly moved. That's all. The quantities of liquor I consumed had gradually increased. I went drinking not only in the neighborhood of the Koenji station, but as far as the Ginza. Sometimes I spent the night out. At bars, I acted the part of the ruffian, kissed women indiscriminately, did anything as long as it was not in accord with accepted usage, drank as wildly, no, more so, as before my attempted suicide, was so hard-pressed for money that I used to pawn Shizuko's clothes. A year had passed since I first came to her apartment and smiled bitterly at the torn kite. One day, along when the cherry trees were going to leaf, I stole some of Shizuko's underrobes and sashes and took them to a pawn shop. I used the money they gave me to go drinking on the Ginza. I spent two nights in a row away from home. By the evening of the third day, I began to feel some compunctions about my behavior, and I returned to Shizuko's apartment. I unconsciously hushed my footsteps as I approached the door, and I could hear Shizuko talking with Shigeko. Why does he drink? It's not because he likes the liquor, it's because he's too good. Because do all good people drink? Uh, Not necessarily, but I'm sure Daddy will be surprised. Maybe he uh, won't like it. Look, it's uh, jumped out of the box. Like the funny man in the comics he draws. Yes, isn't it? Shizuko's laugh sounded genuinely happy. I opened the door a crack and looked in. I saw a small white rabbit bounding around the room. The two of them were chasing it. They were happy, the two of them. I'd been a fool to come between them. I might destroy them both if I'm not careful. A humble happiness. A good mother and child. God, I thought... If you listen to the prayers of people like myself, grant me happiness once, only once, and my whole lifetime will be enough. Hear my prayer. I felt like getting down on my knees to pray then and there. I shut the door softly. I went to the Ginza. Did not return to the apartment. And my next spell as a kept man was in an apartment over a bar close by the Kyobashi station. Society. I felt as though even I were beginning to at last acquire some vague notion of what it meant. It is the struggle between 
one individual and another a then and there struggle in which the immediate triumph is everything. Human beings never submit to human beings. Even slaves practice their mean retaliations. Human beings cannot conceive of any means of survival except in terms of a single then and there contest. They speak of duty to one's country and such like things, but the object of their efforts is invariably the individual, and even once the individual needs have been met, again the individual comes in. The incomprehensibility of society is the incomprehensibility of the individual. The ocean is not society. It is individuals. This is how I managed to gain a modicum of freedom from my terror at the illusion of the ocean called the world. I learned to behave rather aggressively, without the endless anxious worrying I knew before, responding as it were the needs of the moment. When I left the apartment in Koenji, I told the madam of the bar in Kyobashi, I've left her and come to you. That was all I said, and it was enough. In other words, my single then and there contest had been decided, and from that night, I lodged myself without ceremony on the second floor of her place. Society, which by all means should have been implacable, inflicted not a particle of harm on me, and I offered no explanations. As long as the madam was so inclined, everything was all right. At the bar, I was treated like a customer, like the owner like an errand boy, like a relative of management. One might have expected that I would be considered a very dubious character, but society was not in the least suspicious of me. And the regular customers of the bar treated me with an almost painful kindness. They called me by my first name and brought me drinks. I gradually came to relax my vigilance towards the world. I came to think that it was not such a dreadful place. My feelings of panic had been molded by the unholy fear aroused in me by such superstitious of science as the hundreds of thousands of whooping cough germs borne by the spring breezes, the hundreds of thousands of eye-destroying bacteria which infect the public baths, the hundreds of thousands of microbes in the barber shop which will cause baldness, the swarms of scabious parasites infecting the leather straps in the subway cars, or the tapeworm fluke and heaven knows what eggs that undoubtedly lurk in raw fish and in undercooked beef and pork or the fact that if you walk barefoot a tiny sliver of glass may penetrate the sole of your foot and after circulating through your body reach the eye and cause blindness there's no disputing the accurate scientific fact that millions of germs are floating swimming wriggling everywhere at the same time however if you ignore them completely, they lose all possible connections with yourself and at once become nothing more than vanishing ghosts of science. This too I came to understand. I had been so terrorized by scientific statistics. If 10 million people have leave over three grains of rice for their lunch, how many sacks of rice are wasted in one day? If 10 million people each economize one paper handkerchief a day, how much pulp will be saved? That whenever I left over a single grain of rice, whenever I blew my nose, I imagined that I was wasting mountains of rice, tons of paper, and I fell prey to a mood dark as if I had committed some horrible crime. But these were the lies of science, the lies of statistics and mathematics. You can't collect three grains of rice from everybody. Even as an exercise in multiplication or division, it ranks as one of the most elementary and feeble-minded problems about on par with the computation of the percentage of times that people slip in the dark, unlighted bathrooms, and fall into the toilet, or the percentage of passengers who get their feet caught in the space between the door of the subway train and the edge of the platform, or other such foolish exercises in probability. These events seem entirely within the bounds of possibility, but I have never heard a single instance of anyone hurting himself by falling into that toilet. I felt pity and contempt for the self which until yesterday had accepted such hypothetical situations as eminently factual scientific truths and was terrified by them. 
This shows the degree to which I had bit by bit arrived at a knowledge of the real nature of what is called the world. Having said that, I must now admit that I was still afraid of human beings. And before I could meet even the customers in the bar, I had to fortify myself by gulping down a glass of liquor. The desire to see frightening things. That what was drew me every night to the bar where, like the child who squeezes his pet all the harder when he actually fears it a little, I proclaimed to the customers standing at the bar my drunken, bungling theories of art. The comic strip artist. And at that, an unknown one. Knowing no great joys, nor, for that matter, any great sorrows, I craved desperately some great savage joy, no matter how immense the suffering that might ensue. But my only actual pleasure was to engage in meaningless chatter with the customers and to drink their liquor. Close to a year had gone by since I took up this debased life in the bar in Kiyobashi. My cartoons were no longer confined to the children's magazines, but now appeared also in the cheap pornographic magazines that were sold in railway stations. Under silly pseudonym, I drew dirty pictures of naked women, to which I usually appended appropriate verses from the Rabbiat. Waste not your hour, nor in the vain pursuit of this and that endeavor and dispute. Better be merry with a fruitful grape than sadden after none, or bitter fruit. Some of the glories of this world, and some sigh for the prophet's paradise to come. Ah, take the cash and let the promise go, nor heed the music of the distant drum. And that inverted bowl we call the sky, where under crawling cooped we live and die. Lift not your hands to it or help for it, for impotently rolls you or I. There was at this period in my life a maiden who pleaded with me to give up drink. You can't go on drinking every day from morning to night that way. She was a girl of 17 or so who worked in a little tobacco shop across the way from the bar. Yoshiko, that was her name. It was a pale girl with crooked teeth. Whenever I went to buy cigarettes, she would smile and repeat her advice. What's wrong with drinking? Why is it bad? Better be merry with the fruitful grape than sadden after none or bitter fruit. Many years ago, there was a Persian. No, let's skip it. O oh, plague to no more than human or divine, two morrows tangle to itself resign, and loose your fingers in the tresses of the crypt's slender minister of wine. Do you understand? No, I don't. What a stupid little girl you are. I'm going to kiss you. Go ahead, she pouted out her lower lip, not in the least abashed. <laughs> You silly fool. You and your ideas of chastity. There was something unmistakable in Yoshiko's expression which marked her as a virgin who had never been defiled. Soon after New Year, one night in the dead of winter, I drunkenly staggered out into the cold to buy some cigarettes and fell into a manhole in front of her shop. I shouted for Yoshiko to come save me. She hauled me out and bandaged my bruised right arm. Yoshiko... Ernest and unsmiling said, You drink too much. The thought of dying had never bothered me, but getting hurt, losing blood, becoming crippled, and the like. No thanks. I thought as I watched Yoshiko bandage my hand that I might cut down on my drinking. I'm giving it up. From tomorrow on, I won't touch a drop. You mean it? There's no doubt about it. I'll give it up. If I give it up, Will you marry me, Yoshiko? Asking her to marry me was, however, intended only as a joke. She said back, <laughs> Natch. Natch for naturally was popular at the time. <laughs> right. Let's hook fingers on that. I promise I'll give it up. The next day, as might have been expected, I spent drinking. Towards evening, I made my way to Yoshiko's shop on shaking legs and called to her. Yoshiko, I'm sorry I got drunk. Uh, oh, you're awful, trying to fool me by pretending to be drunk. I was startled. I suddenly felt quite sober. Uh, no, it's the truth. I really have been drinking. I'm not pretending. Don't tease me. You're mean. She suspected nothing. 
I should think that you could tell by just looking at me. I've been drinking today since noon. Forgive me. You're a good actor. I'm not acting, you little idiot. I'm going to kiss you. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm not qualified. I'm afraid I'll have to give up the idea of marrying you. Look at my face. Red, isn't it? I've been drinking. It's just the sunset shining on it. Don't try to fool me. You promised yesterday that you wouldn't drink. You wouldn't break a promise, would you? We hooked fingers. Don't tell me you've been drinking. It's a lie. I know it is. Yoshiku's pale face was smiling as she sat there inside the dimly lit shop. What a holy thing uncorrupted virginity is, I thought. I had never slept with a virgin, a girl younger than myself. I'd marry her. I wanted once in my lifetime to know that great, savage joy, no matter how immense the suffering that might ensue. I had always imagined that the beauty of virginity was nothing more than the sweet, sentimental illusion of stupid poets. But it really is alive and present in this world. We would get married. In the spring, we'd go together on bicycles to see waterfalls framed in green leaves. I made up my decision on the spot. It was a then and there decision, and I did not hesitate to steal the flower. Not long afterwards, we were married. The joy I obtained as a result of this action was not necessarily great or savage, but the suffering which ensued was staggering, so far surpassing what I had imagined that even describing it as horrendous would not quite cover it. The world, after all, was still a place of bottomless horror. It was by no means a place of childlike simplicity, where everything could be settled by a single then and there decision. Okie doke. That'll do it for part six of uh, No Longer Human by Osamu Dezai. Um, this is Sleepless Tales. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll catch you in the next one. We're almost done. We should have one, maybe two more episodes of this. We'll be going into the third notebook next. Part two. Part two of the third notebook. That was the end of part one. Um, so starting on page 37, it'll be... Okay. Have a great night, guys.